first on one, The Sky at Night, with Patrick Moore. Good evening. We've been hearing a great deal recently about Mars and its two satellites, Phobos and Deimos. Now, here's a space picture of the larger, Phobos, which is still less than 20 miles across and isn't in the least like our moon. It's a tiny, crater-scarred body. And it may not be a proper satellite at all. It and Deimos may have come from the asteroid zone. And I'm sure you've heard of the asteroids. They are miniature worlds, and most of them keep very strictly to that part of the solar system in between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. So most of them are a long way away. There's only one ever visible with the naked eye, and that is Vesta. And there's a picture of Vesta taken by Frank Ackfield. You can see it as a tiny dot between those two guide arrows. And that cross, lower down in the picture, indicates the position where Vesta had been 24 hours earlier. The other specks, of course, are stars. And they don't seem to shift noticeably compared with each other. But the asteroid is so much closer than it does, even though, telescopically, an asteroid looks exactly like a star. But you know, there's only one asteroid, Ceres, that is as much as 600 miles in diameter and most of the rest are a good deal smaller than that. So when we show some of them, compared with, for example, the British Isles, you'll realize that by planetary standards, they're very small indeed. Now, most of them do keep to that part of the solar system between Mars and Jupiter, but there are some which don't. For example, there's a small one, number 944 Hidalgo, which swings right out beyond the inner planets, beyond Jupiter, and goes out nearly as far as Saturn. And there's also a very strange asteroid, if it is an asteroid, called Chiron, which spends most of its time between the orbits of Saturn and Uranus. That was discovered way back in 1977 by Charles Cowell, and that was the last place you'd expect to find an asteroid. It may be rather in a class of its own. But I think you know that really the most interesting of these asteroids are those that swing inside the orbit of Mars and may come close to the Earth. And the first of these, discovered in 1898, was Eros, and its orbit took it well inside that of Mars, and it can sometimes come within 15 million miles of the Earth. And here's a picture of it, uh, taken by Paul Dirty. There is Eros, that tiny speck on the end of that triangular arrow, and you can see it looks pretty faint. Those two brighter stars, by the way, are Castor and Pollux in Gemini. And Eros is still pretty small, very much smaller than the Isle of Wight. So again, by planetary standards, it's extremely small. But since then, many more what we call near-Earth asteroids have been discovered. And many of them by one person, Eleanor Helene. We are delighted to have her with us this evening. Welcome to the sky at night. Thank you. And of course, you've been over here for a very special ceremony. Yes, it was my pleasure to recently name an asteroid for Professor Alec Boxenberg, a director of the Royal Greenwich Observatory. Um, Alec has been responsible for helping me initiate an asteroid search program in 1979 initially and then later in 81 um, at the UK Schmidt in Australia. Uh, and I had planned from that time to honor Alec with his own asteroid. And it finally it came about recently and his asteroid is 3205. Uh, and uh, I think it pleased him as it did me. Because it is a perfectly normal asteroid in the main group, is it not? Yes, essentially. It has a little higher inclination, a little higher eccentricity, but otherwise uh, it's a main belt asteroid. Well, I know that um, you've been in the asteroid field now for some time. How did you begin your main interest in asteroids? Did you come straight into it, or were you in some other branch of science and astronomy? Well, I was actually in geology, and many of us in uh, the early years were geologists come astronomers. Uh, we uh, knew our geology, we looked at our moon, ground-based uh, observations of the moon, studied the features, and tried to correlate them with what we knew on Earth. And this is what I did as well in these years, uh, studying the moon, the distribution of the craters, uh, color differentiation studies on the moon, uh, moving on to the study uh, of meteorites, that which we felt were responsible, uh, yet small examples of the craters we saw on the moon. And it was at this time I felt it was uh, certainly a, a timely thing to start looking at these larger bodies, the parent bodies of the meteorites, to help relate the cratering that we saw on our moon as well as our planet. And of course we have meteorite cratered on Earth. Of course, and this, this was the, the link up with my geological background. Instead of looking down, I started looking up 
and searching for these big rocks that were responsible for the cratering. This meteor crater is an exa excellent example of uh, the effect of a large body, a relatively large body, in this instance only 100 feet across, that is responsible for this big hole in the ground in Arizona. And uh, certainly this is one of the motivations for the search effort is to learn more about the numbers and the populations of these objects in near Earth space. What equipment do you use for hunting for your near Earth asteroids? We use large field camera telescopes, what is called Schmidt, Schmidt Optics. Uh, uh, the, the initial program and the continuing program has uh, been taken, has taken place at Palomar Observatory. The 18-inch Schmidt is the basic instrument and this has a wide field of view. Uh, it's a very fast camera and it looks somewhat like a cannon and we, <laughs> we call this the fastest gun in the West. Yes. <laughs> and so we cover large areas of the sky uh, six to seven nights a month and this has been, uh, been going on since the early 1970s. And in this period of time, uh, our program and a few associated programs have been responsible for two-thirds of the near-Earth asteroids discovered in this period of time. And um, their now number is something like 110. And when we started, there was less than 10. And of those, only a few were well documented. Of course, you've got the very large Schmidt of Palomar also. Yes. In more recent years, in the last 10 years, I've had access to the 48-inch Schmidt. And with this telescope, we are able to start sampling smaller populations, those uh, perhaps under the uh, 600 feet diameter size. And this is what I want to pursue in the future, too, is, is to represent this, this smaller, uh, smaller objects and this population that we know little of. Well, when we look at a plan of the solar system and see where the main asteroids are, it's very evident that there are some which do come way inside the orbits of the Earth and Mars. And there are various groups, are there not? Yes, there's the Apollo, the Amor, and the Aten asteroids. The Amor asteroids approach the Earth and come uh, just, well, inside 1.3 or passing the orbit of, of Mars and approach the Earth. Uh, the uh, Apollo asteroids l intersect and cross the orbit of the Earth and are Earth crossers, and the Aten asteroids have uh, a semi-major axis, or the, sh the size of its orbit is uh, smaller than that of the Earth. And they spend most of their orbital period within the orbit of the Earth. And of course, they are all very small. Compare them in central London. You see what I mean? Yes, indeed. Which is the largest of them? The largest is Hephaestus, uh, an asteroid that was found in 1978 by the people at the Crimea Observatory, the, um, the Chernix. Yes. And the smallest uh, we found at Palomar, Hathar, which is an Aten type asteroid that is um, about 600 feet. Well, when you're searching for these things, I imagine this all done purely photographically. Yes, photographic telescopes. And by this method, we're able to look at the plates, compare them with uh, their companion plate, uh, study the translation of motion from one exposure to the other, and by this way we have a, a confirmation of the discovery and can calculate the daily motion and then uh, with multiple positions can compute an orbit and then later an ephemeris or be able to predict where it will be a few days from now or a few weeks. How do you study the plates actually? How do I search the plates? Yes, yes. well uh, with the Big Schmidt we literally take our exposures, develop them, put the uh, dry plates on a light table and uh, search just with the hand lens first. Uh, during a time exposure of perhaps an hour, these objects which are close to the Earth will leave a long light trail. So we're virtually looking for trails. And uh, in, in some instances, we've been very uh, fortunate to find two asteroids, two near-Earth asteroids on, on one plate. And in 1983, this is one example where we found uh, 1983 LB and 1983 LC, both on one large 14 by 14 inch foot, um, Schmidt plate. And I'm sure that holds some sort of a record found within three degrees of one another. I think that one of the interesting questions is the possibility of a link between comets and near-Earth asteroids. And the idea that a near-Earth asteroid may be simply a comet that lost all its gas. And I'm thinking, of course, particularly of things like, well, Phaethon a strange asteroid, one of only two that actually goes nearer to the Sun than the planet Mercury. 
And we can see that there. There's the sun in the middle, orbits of Mercury and Venus, then the Earth and Mars, and the main asteroid belt beyond. And there is the elliptical orbit of Phaethon, which takes it into within nine million miles of the sun. So when it's closest in, it may in fact be red hot. It must be an amazing sight. And um, I just wonder, do you think that Phaethon used to be a comet? Well, it certainly looks highly suggestive, as do a number of the near-Earth asteroids that have the long elliptical orbits like Phaeton, which takes it very close to the sun. These are very eccentric orbits. Uh, also, when we learn more about the compositions and colors of these objects, we often find that they're very dark and, again, suggestive of comets. Um, there perhaps is at least uh, a dozen now very good examples of what look like comets in our near-Earth asteroid population. And uh, we definitely feel there's an interrelationship. Uh, although there's ongoing research in this area, uh, there's controversy on both sides. But as far as I'm concerned, I certainly think that we have maybe a 20 or 30 percent uh, contribution by the short period comets that do lose their volatiles as they make multiple passes around the sun and slowly become rather inert, left with the core of the pre-existing comet. Rather strange when you think of something that can be quite spectacular, such as Halley's Comet on occasion. I love this picture of yours showing Halley's Comet together with a quadrantin meteor. But of course, from the Giotto Pass, we've learned a great deal about Halley's Comet. We know now that the nucleus is dark. That was really rather unexpected. This, I think, is an amazing picture of it. Yes. Uh, the, uh the Giotto uh, mission and what we learned from that encounter with Halley was surprising. Uh, we not only found that it was dark, but very dark, uh, a two to three percent. It was larger than we expected because, of course, it was darker than we expected. And uh, we feel that probably Halley certainly serves as an example of a very irregular shaped uh, object which may, in fact, eventually become uh, an asteroid, maybe like the shape of Eros, if you will, or as we relate to it, perhaps uh, uh, either a barefoot or a long potato shape uh, object in space. We've been hearing a great deal about um, missions to comets and also missions from asteroids. I wonder how near that is, and I wonder what are the most accessible asteroids? Well, there's about 10 now that are considered uh, feasible mission candidates. The first few um, uh, they're ranked by their what we call delta V or energy required to rendezvous with the uh, asteroid. These are objects with low inclination and low eccentricities. And the best mission candidate now happens to be an object I found in late 1982, which was designated 1982 XB, which we recovered last November from Palomar. Uh, shortly thereafter, my colleague uh, Steve Ostro was able to um, acquire it from Arecibo. And from uh, this work, we've learned that the object is very small, 350 meters. Uh, it's very rough at a small scale. Uh, we now, based upon the radar acquisition, can tell you very precisely where that will be for at least the next 25 years. And with uh, missions that have been identified by uh, Cynthia Lau and Neil Hulkauer of JPL, uh, we know that we have at least 13 opportunities between now and 2010 and five that are ideal under, oh, it's 5.2 kilometers per second. So this object would be an excellent mission candidate for exploration and rendezvous. I wonder when that would happen. We're thinking perhaps in the early 1990s, 1992-93, uh, craft mission, the Comet Rendezvous Asteroid flyby uh, would be an opportunity to at least fly by uh, several asteroids along its trajectory. We do hope, based upon the mission opportunities, that uh, 3757, uh, the object which we acquired by uh, radar, would also be a feasible uh, object for a mission about in that time frame. Even when you discover these tiny objects, it must be a very difficult matter to keep track of them. Yes, indeed, that uh, consumes a good deal of our time, probably on the order of uh, 20 to 30 percent of our time, each observing run is keeping track with those that we've already discovered, both from the previous month or months, or recovering those that we saw during their last pass by the Earth. And then the other part of our time, two-thirds or more of our observing time each month, we spend on primary search 
areas. And of course, if you do find a really interesting one and then lose it, it can be quite infuriating. And that did happen, of course, to Hermes. Of course, casting my mind back, I remember, you won't, but I do, casting my mind back to 1937, Hermes brushed past us at only about twice the distance of the moon. And newspaper headlines there, Earth escapes from collision, minor planet missed by five and a half hours. And if there were an impact, it would be quite catastrophic. And I suppose it must have happened in the past. Yes, we have uh, many instances and many examples, uh, both on the Earth and, of course, uh, our moon uh, and other terrestrial planets of impact. And uh, one of the uh, prime examples, of course, is Meteor Crater. And uh, this, this uh, hole in the ground in Arizona was made by about a 100-foot object, projectile, an iron-nickel object. And uh, this happened about 25 to 50,000 years ago. And there has been many examples since that time uh, of smaller and large, well, not larger, but smaller objects which have impacted. And of course, there is this theory, I think backed up by considerable evidence, although whether it's correct or not, I don't know, that this happened something like 65 million years ago and even wiped out the dinosaurs by causing yes. a tremendous climatic change. Yes. The dinosaurs uh, certainly had a, a surprise, I'm afraid, <laughs> and were taken back by uh, what we feel is probably uh, about a 10-kilometer size asteroid or pre perhaps even a comet, but nevertheless, which caused an enhancement of a very thin cl clay layer overlaying the Cretaceous limestone. And from this evidence, and we have now identified many sites around the world, which certainly suggests that something came into our atmosphere and caused the extinction not only of the dinosaurs, but other flora and fauna. Well, I wonder. Now, so far as you're concerned, what are the next steps in your own particular research in this field? Well, I'm particularly interested in uh, finding more mission candidates for exploration and, again, spacecraft missions, but also for finding smaller objects. This a uh, group of objects we, we know very little of, and I'm planning to use electronic detection methods with charge-coupled de devices, CCDs, and putting this on the focal plane of uh, Schmidt telescopes. By this way, we can go deeper and also have wide field coverage. So this is in the planning stages. Uh, there is a 48-inch a telescope that JPL has called Table Mountain that within uh, the next six months we hope we'll have an operation. Well, I wish you all success and I thank you indeed for joining it's us. It's been a pleasure. And I think you realize that from this that even though the asteroids may be very small and the near-Earth asteroids particularly small, they are still fascinating bodies and they are very important to us in many ways in our studies of the solar system, in our studies of what's gone before and of course there's always a chance we'll have another near encounter, although please don't get alarmed. So for the moment, Helene and myself, good night. <laughs>